Now, um, now, let's take a look at this. So again, just to recapture, you know, exploring types of data, you know, and then how to organize that into tables and such, right? Describing. And then the idea of probability itself, how you add mutually exclusive or independence, remember that concept coming in here. And then the types of distributions. You have a probability distribution, uh, you know, what they are, what do they consist of? They consist of, you know, they can't be a negative, and the sum of the whole area has to be one, right? And then we get into different types of distributions themselves, right? Eventually leading to hypothesis testing that tells us how we can use these distributions to put a boundary on and, and to see whether the data supports a null hypothesis or not. You know, it's like um, there, 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 there is a, in quantum mechanics, in quantum physics, there's an equation called the standard model, okay? The standard model has been able to predict uh, chemical reactions and, um, a, a, and almost, in, in a way, predict any kind of reaction and what the result's going to be with such a degree of accuracy, that is, the equation itself seems to model nature very, very well. And nothing that we've measured and tested has ever come that close to being that accurate. The, it's like you go back about seven decimal points before there's a difference. That's nothing that we know of in science has agreed that much and that well. So when you have something like that, we call it a theory, but we mean fact. Is it, is it I mean, it's pretty, it's about as close as we can get to say, yeah, it's 100% true, right? But certainly that's better than saying, okay, something else. Now, in that equation is a variable called H, which it stands for the Higgs, and one of the mathematicians or physicists who, who said for this thing to work, there has to be this Higgs boson as part of the equation. And, we, and they've been using that for years and years under the assumption that this thing exists. Because without it, they can't make good production. That is some other particle in nature called the Higgs boson that must exist because it gives mass to elements. That's what gives it its mass. You know, so right now, what the state of physics is that you and everything around you, everything that's matter is made up of fields, like a magnetic field. You know the field of a magnetic field? Well, you have gravitational field, you have weak and strong force fields, right? Well, you've got this Higgs field everywhere in the universe. And when you have these different fields, they interact. Some of them will go through each other like no problem at all. But some of these different fields interact and start to ripple where they're interacting, like where they're adding up. And that, believe it or not, that vibration of the interconnection of different fields is what creates matter. Matter is nothing but a vibrating fields that are crisscrossing. That's the state of physics today in terms of what, it really, what matter really is made of. Okay. Anyhow, I point out that the equation that it finds is super accurate, the most accurate we've ever had in any scientific. And that H, Higgs boson, was over in the CERN and the collider at CERN in Europe. You know how much they spent for that machine? That's the most complicated and biggest machine in the world. They sent two, two protons down this magnetic field, right, by changing the field, they can they can change the charge and that pushes the, the thing and they say one going one direction and one's going the other direction like this and they're about 99% the speed of light and when that hits you see E equals MC squared that energy is mass you know normally we take mass and we throw a log in the fire and it creates heat and energy of different forms right but this is the other way around the energy will actually turn into matter which you're not used to seeing at that velocity so different particles pop out right after the collision it's hit so hard, right? So, one of the main things that they did, they had enough power up and out, what, guess what they found? The Higgs boson, which is great because they've been dependent on that for a long time, so they were elated that they're, now they actually have verifiable proof that there exists the Higgs, but there are four forces and 12 particles of nature, and that's it, total of 16 that we know of. Okay, anyhow, that's enough of that. So, let's see, uh, I wanted to go to seven, right? Um, okay, now, the chapter of this thing is estimating the parameters. W well, what, what the heck are parameters? Here we go again. If you don't know what a parameter is, what? 
what am I, what am I, what are you learning? How do you estimate the parameter? You estimate it from the sample statistics. The sample statistics are the estimators of the parameters. Those pictures that I drew, uh, let's see, where did I have that, over here? Yes. These guys are the freaking parameters, okay? I don't know how many times I've said that. And this over here are the sample statistics. We're using these individual guys to help make predictions about these guys or hypothesis, okay? So, I mean, I can't take the first step if you don't know what a parameter is. You can't pass the course. I mean, it's impossible. You cannot just try to survive from section to section, but you're not understanding what's going on. Anyhow, um, okay. So those are the parameters. Now, we're estimating these parameters. How? With these freaking guys. How do we calculate this? Well, it often depends on the distribution, whether you get it as like, you know, a frequency histogram or if you get the raw data. But in general, we, we've done this a hundred times, you know, it's the sum of everything. So X bar is simply an average. Where you sum in all your X of I's, these are all the observations in here, not just these statistics, but all of the thing that you drew from here, right? And you divide by little n. That's X bar. <laughs> That's what we're going to do to estimate mu. Now, if you actually knew God's truth, well, you wouldn't be messing with it. You'd take out all the observations in the entire population from I equals 1 to capital N. Whereas here, I equals 1 to little n. And you would divide this by, you would divide it by capital N, and that would give you the true mu. But you don't know. You just don't know, because you don't have, this is too big or too over or changing too fast. All right? And, and this guy, so X bar is this. Right? What's the sample, the, the deviation? It's exactly the deviation of every observation. So this guy is equal to every observation, subtract the mean from it. That is the deviation from the mean. That quantity is squared and divided by n minus 1 and square root. That is the deviation from our sample statistic. That value can be used to help predict this value, okay? The histogram is going to help us determine, predict, what is the true distribution of the population. I, I don't know what else to, you know, say really, but I'm going ahead to give you an idea why I keep pushing this. Because if you don't get a grasp around that, you're really not going to get the course. And that's usually what happens with statistics. Most of you take it because I got to have it. I can't go on without it. But I'm trying to tell you why is it that everybody now has to take a statistics course? Because it's very important in decision making, in risk analysis. And almost every field you get into now has some form where you have to analyze the data. Difference between a manager and a regular worker. Regular worker won't be able to do any of this. The manager will help give the supervisors or the administrators an idea of the direction, whether they follow it or not, that's their business. But that's usually where you'll end up in some place there where they're coming to you for advice. You're giving advice based on empirical studies, empirical evidence, the best you can with a certain degree of probability. So even if you're wrong, you're going to get paid, right? But if you're right, more often than not, you're worth a lot. <laughs> okay. I spoke about confidence intervals. So P, now P is not, uh, we haven't seen P in the parameters, right? But if you're taking a proportion, like a proportion, like they tell you 30% uh, of this population is, all right, let's see. Um, let me show you something here that's just, just one, this is the very tail end of chapter six. And chapter six, do you remember we used, well, we used the histogram, right, to determine the distribution? But when we think it's normal, there's another test that we can do just to verify it. It's called a quantile normality test. That's all this part covers. So that was on, on six. So um, if I go to, uh, so I got my, my e-text on the other guy. I don't need this anymore. Okay, uh, I have an e-text. Now, um, let's take a look at this uh, problem here. So I'm going to go to StatCrunch to show how that works. 
Okay, so I go to Stat Crunch now. In this particular one, uh, we could talk about. Uh, so I go to a data set. Let's say, if you really want to get involved, and I look at the data sets so you can work your problems. Uh, there's one about uh, Old Faithful, which is uh, I don't know if anyone to Yellowstone Park. There's an, a geyser there that goes off ever so often and has been for <laughs> you know a long time, but the whole area apparently is just one big volcano. I mean, immense. The whole thing could shoot and change everything, but um, old faithful. Okay, so I'll show you, just give you an idea how you might be able to work some of these problems to see if you know you like them too. I mean, if you can do it, because you'll be able to do hypothesis testing on here, and it'll, it'll take a lot of the processing out of calculating it by hand. But um, if I want to take a look at the, like the histogram, and um, so um, if I just looked at the histogram and I look at the the duration. Um, you know how long it lasted, let's say. So if I go to histogram, and then I'll talk about after, these are the time intervals, right? And this is the duration of it, so you can see that uh, it has, like, that's the histogram. Now if we want to go over to this other thing, and then, and then I go to the QQ plot, right? And then, uh, so it's the same thing. But I want to see if the data is normal. This is without looking at the histogram. There's another means, right? You want to look at the histogram, too. Uh, let's see if I want to put this. Uh, I'm put this. Put the y-axis there. Okay. All right. So we can see that this doesn't, if it, if it were normal, these things would line up right along the corn tail. So we suspect that it's not normal. So hopefully our histogram will give us, lend us Okay. Now, the only, <laughs> the only thing I keep in mind is that within the sample statistics, right, one of them is called the sample mean, X bar, yes? Keep in mind, there's a whole other testing involved when we're talking about X bar has its own distribution. So we can talk about, actually, the true X bar <laughs> using the same technique, but within, with using a central. Okay. Uh, any question about that? Okay. Let's see. Um, I guess I don't. But it's pretty handy because here are all the things. The books is, is, is these, these are all the different, many of the different. There's the IQ and brain size. That's pretty cool. IQ and lead. That will be. Uh, uh, IQ. Year one, year two. Um, this is what, verbal? Uh, I don't really know. I haven't read the problem. but Well, if I just did a, uh, well, anyway, let's do lead. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I want, what the one, I, I don't know what it stands for. I better wait till I figure it out. <laughs> but anyway, you can have fun with these. And um, so let's go back to uh, stat crunch. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Confidence interval. Okay, now, I was telling you about P. That's what I was talking about, P. Uh, before I get back here, okay. All right, so a proportion. Now, um, let's see if I go here. Okay. I'm going to clear that. Okay, so there, there's something called a proportion, and it's locked like, so this is my population. Okay, my population, okay. So we also, as another, I haven't shown you, but you have mu. You have sigma, and you have something called little p. If, but that's only in the case of something that's using a proportion. That is, if they say 21% of some amount, let's say x, right? That turns out to be, it, that's, this is a proportion, OK? And it turns out that over here in our sample statistics, that we're going to calculate a p hat, which is going to be the best predictor of p just like we have S for the Bechtel. This is only for proportions. When you're looking at studies for doing, using proportions, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll show that. And this one is X bar. And this is sample size N. This is a sample. Now, so that's what Chapter 7 is talking about now, is that this proportion P that we're going to use, proportion hat to be the best X. Okay. Okay, so now we have estimating a population proportion. I'm not sure what that is. So A2 is the... Uh, is that bell curve table? Um. The binomial distribution for the second report is satisfied that there's been a 
Okay, so if you're not going to use the binomial distribution, you can use the normal. For you to use the normal, you have two constraints. One is that she'll show you what the... I'll, I'll, I'll talk for her. <laughs> Let me just bring it up there. So n times p, that's the proportion, right, that we would use p hat for. If that's greater than 5, and q, remember q is 1 minus p. If that's greater than 5, then it might be easier to use the normal curve than go to the binomial. Okay, the binomial is discrete. That's all she's saying. Estimating, uh, there, let's see, that, that, that's, that's going to be in. I think that brings up the book. You guys must have a lot of fun with this, huh? Here's the point estimation. Okay. So a point estimation is a single value used to estimate the population parameter. What's this another way of saying what? Sample statistics. Except we're learning something new. They're going to have this p hat because we're talking about proportion, but it's the same as we're going to have this little p, okay? So the sample proportion p hat is the best point estimator, right? Notice it says sample proportion p hat like x bar. Yes? Is the best estimation of the little p I was telling you about back in the population thing. Okay, now uh, here's an example of Facebook. Look, you see this? It's a 43% of that. That's not the mean. That's a proportion of the total pop. What they're saying, 43 of these percent, right? Okay. So, so what does that mean? Okay. So we're going to call p 0.43. Now, if you multiply that times n, remember, I don't know if you remember this, but a p and a q, we usually use that in a binomial distribution. It was either success or failure, and then how many ways you could randomize and out, right? And it's a discrete. So you have to add them all up. You can't just find the area and the curve's not so easy. You understand what I'm saying? So they got this thing using the normal curve. If n times p was greater than 5, remember? And n times q. What's q? Well, that's going to be easy because q is going to be 1 minus. I kind of feel we should go next door and listen to that movie here. Uh, this uh, we I already showed you what a confidence interval is. You can just as well put what a confidence interval around. Guess what's in the middle? That little p. Guess what you're going to bind it by? Yes, p hat plus an error term. Yes. What are you going to do here? Well, you're going to put p hat again minus the error term with a certain probability of being you believe that you're going to have a certain confidence of let's say 95%. Right? Again, we're bounding God's truth with our estimator from the sample statistic. Okay, now, here's what I was talking about earlier. Um, okay, now, here's what I'm saying that this is called one, do you see where it says here, the confidence interval, the probability of one minus alpha. So if you set, you decide you want a 95% confidence, right? So CI. So that means 1 minus alpha is equal to, see the 1 minus alpha? To whatever you decide to set it at. 95, right? That's, I don't know if you remember, but I, I solve for A so that A end up equal 1 minus 0.95. Do you remember? And then I had 0 0.05, right? In the case of a two-tail test, I divided that 2. If it was a one-tail test, would look like what? Well, it'd be just one side with the whole amount. Now, how would that be constructed? Well, if you had a null hypothesis like this, right? And you say, I believe that the mean, except or p, whatever you want, is equal to something. I don't know. Let's say whatever it is, <laughs> something twenty-one. Let's say I don't, I'm just making it up. And then the alternative is, if I write my alternative like this, the alternative is greater than twenty-one. Do you see that? That is a one-tail test to the right. So I would put the whole, this thing all in one set. But if I say it's not equal to, I have to do both sides. That's a two-tail. All right, but anyway, that's a head. Okay, now look. All they've done is say, this is, I want a 90% confidence, so guess what alpha is? 1 minus 0.9. Okay. All right, good. So let's go on down. Okay. So here we got the, the true... The, the, these are the capstones on both sides. That will be, we'll see where that's headed. Okay, so this is how you should read it. And you'll ask, you'll see questions on your homework about 
what does it mean? What does a confidence interval mean? So we are 95% confident that the interval b b between the left side of the confidence interval and the right side, right, actually does contain the true value of God's truth of the population P, right? We say with a 95 degree confidence. That's freaking amazing to me. And you know, all these people say, well, what do I need math for? I go, what don't you? What? If you don't have it, you're going to be handicapped. At least uh, some understanding of it. So this is the interval, you see. And these are different samples that were ran. And this is one that was, parts of it were outside the range. If you're going to make a decision on something, shouldn't it, shouldn't it be based on something that the evidence supports? That's what I mean. It's just like that equation in science, the standard model is so accurate. And for years, but yet, in order for it, it has to be, there has to be a way of disproving. No, what I'm saying, how do I want to say this? Science requires that it could be disprovable. Otherwise, it becomes like a religious dogma. In other words, if we, if we do ever find where the standard deviation, that standard model comes out wrong, then it's a problem, right? Because you only have to disprove it one time. It's not working. All right, now, look, look. Do you remember the alpha? We divided it by two, do you recall? Yeah. Okay, now that, you can look at your table, remember? Yeah. Or the strat crunch, and you're going to solve for this Z sub alpha two. Why is it called Z sub alpha two? That's a subscript. That doesn't mean times or anything. That's Z sub alpha two. They want to know the Z value right here. Okay, the only way to do it is you look at the table, and now you know what's in the, ta you know what's in the guts, right? So you go from the guts out to the z-score, yes? And that gives you your z-score. All right, so we have a z-score over here too, right? But we can see it's symmetric, true? So if it's there, that's positive z, that's a negative z, yeah? Okay. Do you understand this z sub alpha 2? I'm not sure, I haven't worked one yet. We'll work one, but I want you to know that the z, this axis is, you remember when we standardized it? This is the z-axis, and this is after it's been centered over zero. Okay, so if I'm telling you I want a certain confidence around it, then I'm going to build it around that, and that's the values of Z I need to know. Why do I need to know those values of Z? Why? Because I'm going to use that calculation as part of the error term that puts the boundary around the truth. This is where the probability comes in through the distribution. Okay, that critical value, the term critical value, is those terms right here mm -hmm. the term under the table this area here and this area here that that a's is not the z it's how much area is contained in the blue and the green you have to get out of that by going back to the actual the and these points that i'm talking about are called the critical values <laughs> i keep doing that Okay, so if we go to the table and we look at point zero, look, that's, we want a 95% confidence, yes? That puts in, I divided by two, right? So now I've got point zero two five because I got a point zero five total alpha. And since I want both sides, I split that under the area. And now let's, uh, I got to look at the table and um, <coughs> <coughs> let's see if I can find, anyhow, uh, I'll show you how, to, what, what, what we'll do is, remember the table fills in from this way back. So if you calculate this, this area here, right, obviously one minus that is going to be from here on back. <laughs> right? So we will look that up. Uh, I'll, I'll bring it up next, but let's see what the, so. Now, there's your error term. That's what I was asking you. This is the error term, which includes the Z sub alpha 2, which is determined by what you want the confidence interval to be. No, yeah. Okay, when I do this, my whole idea is to eventually, notice I have a P hat and a Q hat. You see that? P hat and Q hat? I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Or is it too small? Okay, now, the P hat, Q hat. Okay, now. What I was saying is that when we set this up, let's see. 
Well, when, in this case, I'm not talking about, remember the, the, the parameter is what we're looking at. Not mu this time, and not sigma. Yeah, we're looking at a true proportion. They tell us that this is what they think the proportion is, right? And we're going to bind it by what? P hat, right? Plus the error term, which is going to be Z sub alpha divided by 2, right? Which we looked up from the table, multiplied times P hat Q hat divided by N. And guess what on this side? It's P hat again, the estimate minus Z some alpha divided by 2, right? Mm -hmm. Times this thing, P hat Q hat divided by N. Now, what I had told you earlier was whatever it is, whatever it is, whether it's mu, right? And we're going to bound that too. But we don't use P hat, we use X bar, that's the average. And this whole thing is an error term, except it'll be different values because we're talking about this guy, right? But it will be an error term. So sorry. So we, what we'll have is this uh, X bar plus an error term, right? And, and again, your X bar minus an error term, all right? And then we'll have the probability of having that with whatever confidence interval you want to have. That's the probability, okay? So we cannot build a confidence interval about God's truth we have p hat already from the problem. We have our confidence interval. It tells us it's 0 0.025 on each part of the tail, yes? And that converts into z-scores. Then you can construct your confidence. Yeah, so p hat, you know, p hat is going to be equal to 1 minus q hat, right? So that, that comes from the binomial, remember? Normally we'd use binomial, but there could be times where it's there. So here's, so let's see. So here, uh, um, so, starting again, whatever your confidence interval is, set it to 1 minus alpha and solve for alpha. Take that, divide it by 2, construct your bell curve, because you're going to use the bell curve as an approximation, right? And now this is your error term. Guess what? There's going to be the same thing for mu, exactly the same thing for mu, the confidence interval, x bar plus an error term, x bar minus, yes. There's going to be the same thing for sigma. It's going to be s in an error term and s in an error term. You understand what I'm saying? It's the same thing. And once you got that, you got it. And there's a term. Notice that saying, population, which means what? It's a parameter, p hat. Sample, it's telling you. It's from our sample. N, right? E is the error term, which we're going to calculate. And Z sub alpha 2 is coming from the fact that alpha is divided by 2. Once you set whatever confidence interval you want, you want to be how confident? I want to be 99% confident, let's say. That's going to be rough, right? Because to be 99% confident, so, but that's okay. If my confidence are 99%, right? And I subtract one from that, right? I'm going to have 0 0.01, right? Of which I'm going to have to divide by two, you know, alpha divided by two, right? To tell me how much area I got on each side of the bell curve. This right here, the area is alpha divided by two, and this is alpha by two. What you need to do now is find the critical value of z sub alpha divided by 2 minus and z. So that's what you need to find. You need to find that point to actually calculate their term. That's where the probability comes in. Do you see how the distribution is sipping into the prediction? Does anybody see what I'm talking about? Do we need another little quick quiz? Uh, what part? The uh, how, it all how it all connects. That will hit you sometime when, and it'll be like for a second, you go, damn, I think I understood it all there for a second. Then it went away. <laughs> okay, anyhow, uh, can we use the normal curve for this binomial situation, PQ? PQ means binomial. Is it success or not? What can we use? It? Well, it says, you know, uh, the sample, you know, we took it randomly, right? And then we have these conditions that are required, and one of them is that N times Q and m times p is greater than 5. When we want to substitute, the, then we can use to get those z-scores from the bell curve. <laughs> so can, OK, now, uh, this, again, is the, z, is the error term, right? How we saw it was more like it was this divided by n. You know, they just got turned for, this is not the way to do it. It's the way that prints, you know, because of the publishing. But OK, so guess what it is? It's that easy. It's p hat minus e and p hat plus e. Okay, so let's take a look at this example.
Okay. Is there a multiple formulas to setting this up? A uh, multiple what? Formulas to like set up the equations. Because like, uh, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Because like these, you can narrow the book. What are these? If you can read any of that. Like you can zoom in if you want. What I don't know what those. Those are going to be the test statistics, right? When we have, when he's looking at these, he's showing me these these different equations. But what he's looking at are test statistics. So that's a good good thing you brought it up. So remember, I have a bell curve, and I decide what kind of confidence I want. So let's say I'm going to put this alpha over two here and alpha over two here, right? And then I'm going to find out what these z critical values are, right? Okay. Now he's showing me a list of equations. Depending what it is you're testing, that test statistic is where you're going to see where it hits on this side or in here. If it lands in here, you accept the null. You're going to accept the null hypothesis. If you're not, you're going to reject it in favor of the alternative. And at no point did I say it's absolutely wrong. I just say it doesn't look like the data supports it. That's what that'll be, and we'll get that there. But we haven't. That's actually I don't know coming up. It's good that you asked that because that makes that was a good question for that. That's, that's where we're headed. So, um, oh, here we go again. Forty-three percent of this is what we're going to call our the p hat, <coughs> right? Do we know what p is? We don't. We don't know what p is, but we know we can put a boundary around it. We're trying to put a boundary around the true p. Okay, so, and we want to do a 95, calculate the error term to a 95% confidence interval, yes? And we're going to find that 95% confidence interval, and then based on results, can we safely conclude that fewer than 50% of the adults have Facebook pages? Uh, okay, so, let's see how that you might work this. Uh, I'm going to go like this. Okay, um, so hmm. so normally you'd have like a binomial, but our sample size is big enough, and then we get m q and n and q. Uh, I wonder, do they have this one on uh, the data on our on Facebook? Is I wonder if that's on that. Uh, <coughs> okay. <coughs> <coughs> They got uh, 639 out of that subject to Facebook, okay. All right, now, they're using technology on this one, so I don't know. Uh, well, okay, when you use technology, it automatically connect, collects the error term, calculates it for you, and including the Z thing. So I was thinking, I don't know if we have that table. Maybe we can work one on this. Let's go back forward to see if they, uh, okay. So they have the confidence interval. What do you want? 95% confidence interval. Sample size, easy enough. Number of successes, that was P, P hat. Do you remember? Yeah. That's the 43% of whatever it was, right? So now we go, boom, evaluate, look at that. Confidence interval already set. It took your error term, it calculated the table, Z values, it's subtracted and added. And it tells you what? Tells Yeah. There it is. 95% confidence interval that we believe this contains the true proportion P. But let's say you're going to do it by hand because this all did it for you. All right. You need to do one or some by hand, at least to appreciate how much work you're saving. Okay, here we are. When we looked at the table, which we can do, we'll find that the Z critical values will be plus and minus 1.96. Um, I'll show you that in a second. Now, what I'll be, when in order to get the 9.6, I have half of the alpha value, right? But we wanted a confidence interval, confidence interval of how much? Uh, 95. So here we go. Now, the error term itself, there's the 1.96. That's a Z sub alpha 2. And that was the, you remember P hat, Q hat, and that was N. 
Okay, that's the error term. What do we do? We take our p hat, add the error term, p hat from the man main side, right? Take the p hat and subtract it. So 0.43 minus the error term. You see it? Bounding p on the left and binding p on the right. So they round it off, okay? Now, it concludes that you can take one of these and just say plus and minus 0 0.025, right? That's the way of putting it abbreviated. Now, we want 95% confidence for the true population probability. Remember the P without the hat? And we would express that as this. Okay, now, here's how we answer that question uh, about the 50% thing. Uh, and okay, so, okay, so based on the confidence interval, it does appear that fewer than 50% of the adults have a fate. Now, notice they haven't done a test statistic here because there isn't really a null hypothesis set up. But they kind of generate it on the side to get you thinking, like, does it look like 50% will fit into that range, right? So you can see where 50% might hit. Does it hit inside? No. So it says, uh, so based on the confidence of um, obtain, uh, interval obtained, yeah, it does appear that probably there are fewer than 50% of the population in the United States is on Facebook, which is still a huge amount, you know, <laughs> it's like 40%, but anyhow, you get the idea? So if I went to this, um, let's see, I, I forget where I'm at here. Uh, I'm trying to think, how do I um, pull up that table uh, of the, you know, the normal curve? I don't know. Let me see. Uh, Oh, is there? Okay. So, um, this not this doesn't really tell me how it's filling up. Let's see. Okay, it's going from left to right. Okay, do you remember that, that half of 0 0.05 is what? Remember it was 0 0.0025? Um, okay. So, if I go to 0 0.0025, let's go right here. Uh, oh, 0 0.0025. I'm looking in the guts. Negative 2.8 at the point zero zero what? Well, which one did I get the 1.96 for? The uh, 1.96. Let's see. 1.9. Shoot. Which 1.96? Uh, that's it right there. Coming down. It's right here. 1.96. Hmm. Oh, here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was, if it was 0 0.5, you had to divide that in half. That was 0 0.025, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but remember, I had to subtract that from 1 because that's that way all the way back. So there's the 1.96. Okay. Well, that was the book. Okay. All right. So that's, now that's going to work. We're going to do this again for X bar and for sigma lowercase sigma okay yeah they change because remember the z sub alpha 2 yeah. is drawn from a normal but we'll not always draw from a normal so that would change depending on the that's where the distribution comes in that's why it's important that the histogram tell you what the distribution is of the true population you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. okay. i don't know if anybody yeah okay so um let's see do i have good Okay, um, okay, what was this one on? That's the one we did? Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead just to see what, where we're headed now. Um, never think that poll results are unreliable if the sample size is small, percentage of the, the population size usually is not a big factor. It's a factor, but not a big factor. So here's another way of just estimating p hat by taking the difference between the upper interval limit and the other one. It's a, it's a way of estimating p hat and the way of estimating error. It's kind of a hit and miss. Uh, so the same thing. I'll let you look at that because it's, it's just a, another way of estimating those sample statistics. Okay, now we just said that it wasn't that important. Now they're asking you to determine sample size. This is something you'll have to calculate for your project because 
when you calculate chapter 8, you want to do hypothesis testing, you want to know, well, how big should my sample size be? And you might have to think backwards, well, I'd like to have a confidence interval of so much. Can you use that to help calculate back to what your sample size should be? All right, so. Um, okay, well, this we did before. We had Piat. Here's a Z sub alpha. The, that's the score separating the areas on the tails, right? And, uh, okay, now, if you'll take a look at this, do you remember that Z sub alpha 2 is dependent on what your confidence interval is? So if you take that, square it P hat, and divide it by E squared, that tells you how big your sample should be. So when you look at some of these polls, you know, and you've got millions of elector uh, uh, voters, you, you'd be surprised how small that can be to make confident interval of the whole. 7-3? I th uh, or is that just I don't know if they, well, if they, they uh, let's see, this is when no estimate, okay. that's that, remember that, the way I told you to estimate it? Okay, so you can see the usefulness, uh, I think, um, all right, so this is about how many people use the internet, and so, again, I'm on a 95% confidence, so there's that 1.96 again, right, so, we want to calculate n. 1.96, what was, what was the, what we're using as our p hat? Well, our p hat is 0 0.80, right? The q hat is 0 0.20. And now, uh, this error term, uh, e squared, yeah, I don't know, I'll tell you a margin of error, 0 0.03. Okay, now, this is what it came out. You should have a sample size of 1,000. And that's not bad. I mean, if you're thinking, yeah, how about everybody's voting? Of course, unless the Russians get involved, then you don't know. But we've been doing the same thing, I see. Um, okay. All right, that's that. Uh -huh. Uh, that's the population side, remember, is capital N. Now let's go on. Let's see. This thing should be. I don't know. This is just a different type. These are different methods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think you really need to know this one. Uh, it's a. Um, it's another way of coming up with a confidence interval. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's, it's poetic. Which method is bad? I'm best. I don't really care as long as you know that one. Okay. And uh, that's. So, should we call it a day? Any questions? Okay. And now you know what statistics is for. For you mean from the for degrees of freedom? Yeah. That's with a different kind of distribution. Okay. I don't know which one your table you're looking at. Uh, okay, so that's a, that's called a T distribution, which is a lot like the bell curve, but because you know even less. I mean, they're they're not, not quite as confident. The T, the T distribution uh, looks like, this is the bell curve, right, standardized. The T distribution is a little bit wider like this <laughs> to, to encompass some extra error that you might not have, like you might not be f like, like a smaller sample size or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I guess that's next, huh? Why? Yeah, the degrees of freedom will be, um, we'll, we'll talk about that.